Hello, everybody. On behalf of the Circular Economy Leadership Coalition and the Energy Futures Lab, welcome to our WCEF side event, Powering the Circular Economy, the Role of Hydrogen. Um, we will introduce ourselves in just a few minutes. But before we do that, we'd actually like to check in with you, the audience first. So if you would just type in the chat box where you were dialing in from today, that will give us a sense of the geography of our conversation. That would be great. Excellent. Calgary, Vancouver, Ottawa, Edmonton, Fernie, excellent. Montreal, Toronto, Victoria, Gatineau, London from the UK, Singapore, Couch and Valley in Vancouver Island, Saskatchewan, wonderful, excellent. So we have people from all over the place, certainly uh, heavily weighted to Canada so far, but we have some international participants as well. And welcome to you all. Many thanks for being with us today. Um, we're going to just start, I'll introduce myself and uh, I'll get Stephanie to do that as well as your co-moderators for today. My name is Sarah Brooks and I'm speaking to you today from the cold and snowy mountains of interior British Columbia in Western Canada where I work on the unceded territories of the Sinaiaks and Tanaha First Nations uh, here in the Kootenai region. And I work with um, the Natural Step Canada, an international not-for-profit organization with a focus on circular economy issues. Stephanie. Good day, and I'm Stephanie Cairns, also coming to you from Western Canada. I acknowledge the Likwongan peoples on whose traditional territory I live and work and the Songhees, Esquimalt, and Waisanich people whose historical relationships with the land continue to this day. I'm the director of the Circular Economy Program at the Smart Prosperity Institute, and I'll be moderating along with Sarah today. Over to you, Sarah, to give us an overview of our session. Thanks, Stephanie. Uh, next slide, please, Kelly. Okay, so just a brief check in on um, how we're going to have the conversation today. And before that, just a bit of narrative background. The Circular Economy Leadership Coalition um, here in Canada works to advance the circular economy in Canada. The Energy Futures Lab works to build the energy system the future requires in Alberta. And uh, what we realized in conversation with each other fairly recently is that while both our constituencies are doing extremely important work to help create the future that we all need, we've not yet taken the opportunity to speak together in a robust way about how we power that aspect of the Canadian economy uh, that is very relevant to circular economy issues like reverse logistics, the lack of rail infrastructure and so on, um, high heat industrial processes, all of which are important for circular economy and of course need to be powered in some way and which make up a large part of the Canadian economy. So we thought it would be interesting to have a conversation together to explore how these two constituencies can and or should work together. And thus was born an initial hypothesis, which we are going to explore together today with you. And this hypothesis you may have seen in the write-up uh, for the session itself, but that blue hydrogen is a viable solution to power long haul transportation and high heat industrial processes in, uh, for the North, America, North American emerging circular economy. So how we're going to explore that hypothesis is as follows. We'll have a brief level setting um, on circular economy from Stephanie in just a moment. Then we are going to go over to a fabulous lineup of panelists who are going to help us uh, level set on hydrogen and walk us through some of the emerging hydrogen aspects of the um, opportunity. And then together we will explore this hypothesis and how blue hydrogen can or should or should not uh, be a major player in powering that aspect of the circular economy that relies on long haul transportation and high heat industrial processes. And that part will be uh, very much in collaboration with you, the audience. So um, without further ado, I will pass it over to Stephanie to talk about circular economy. Next slide, please, Kelly. Thank you, Sarah. I've been tasked with providing a very short introduction to the concept of a circular economy. Briefly, while in Canada, we're already two decades in to a focus on low carbon, the circular economy is a much newer agenda, which adds a focus on other planetary limits and material security for tomorrow's growing global population 
and rising prosperity levels. <clears throat> On the left here, you see a stylized sketch of the system we now have, a linear system in which more than 90% of the resources which are extracted for the global economy are used once only and then disposed of. This is a loss to the economy with valuable materials literally being thrown away. And it's not only the materials that are lost, there's also the water, energy, pollution and land use impacts arising from each pound that goes to landfill or incineration. This model is unsustainable over the long term if we're to meet the needs of future populations. On the right, you see a similarly simplified sketch of an ideal circular economy, which is designed to make optimal use of raw materials and resources. By reusing products and raw materials, resources are continuously cycled in a way that generates the highest economic value and the least environmental damage. And cycled secondary materials become significant sources for the economy. Next slide, please, Kelly. The circular economy draws inspiration from the natural world where materials cycle infinitely in one form or other and there's no such thing as waste, only resource. The pioneering think tank in this field, uh, the UK based Ellen MacArthur Foundation offers three principles for a circular economy. One, design out waste and pollution such as the release of greenhouse gases. Two, keep products and materials circulating in the economy, use things rather than using them up. And three, regenerate natural systems. For example, focusing on preserving, enhancing and sustainably managing renewable resources while limiting the use of non-renewable ones. And the benefits to this approach to decoupling economic growth from expanding resource use are seen to be Notably, increasing the security of material supply, reducing environmental pressures, while also creating new social economic value. Next slide, please. So the circular economy is about much more than recycling. It approaches looking at industrial and consumer waste as a resource management issue rather than a waste management challenge. This model, which is from um, our Quebec-based partner, IEDEC, uh, part of the Circular Economy Leadership Coalition, outlines four major strategies for the circular economy. Rethinking to reduce resource consumption and preserve ecosystems, for example, through approaches such as efficiency of um, manufacturing production and the design of products. <clears throat> Optimizing resource use by intensifying product use through approaches such as renting rather than owning and by extending the life of products and optimizing resource use through reuse, recovery and recycling of byproducts and waste while keeping these materials at their highest and best use. To achieve this, many shifts will be required. Shifts in how we design, manufacture, sell, consume, use, and manage materials, products, and services. Uh, can you give us the next build, please, Kelly? In turn, these will require shifts in technologies, products, and business practices. Some of these challenges will be straightforward, but some will require complex system-wide transformation, collaboration along supply chains, and new legal and business models. So the discussion for today is does blue hydrogen to power long haul transportation and high heat industrial processes have a place in this journey towards North America's emerging circular economy? Over to you, Sarah, to introduce our first panelist. And now let us, we're gonna head over here into our virtual room. We've got a fabulous lineup of folks who are gonna to talk to us about hydrogen and blue hydrogen in its various aspects as related to circular economy and uh, we're going to just introduce them to you and have them introduce themselves to you in a way that looks like this. So I'll begin with David. David Lazell is a um, University of Calgary professor and he's also the Chief Energy Systems Architect for the Transition Accelerator, a nonprofit focused on the net zero energy system transition in Canada. David works with industry, with governments and academics to build credible and compelling transition pathways to a vibrant hydrogen economy across Canada. 
And David, um, to introduce yourself to the folks on the line here, can you share with us three words that describe why you feel Canada should look to blue hydrogen as it seeks to meet its 2050 GHG targets and embark on a circular economy journey? Three words, okay, jobs in clean energy. That's four words, but we'll make the in small. Thank you very much. That's great. Stop. Right, and it's my pleasure to introduce Grant Strem. Grant has spent many years working with upstream oil and gas producers before moving into reserves evaluation and banking. He later started his own oil company, which focused on light oil, helium, and geothermal resources, both domestically and internationally. Grant's focus changed in 2015 when he co-founded Proton Technologies, a process for harvesting hydrogen from deep hydrocarbon reservoirs. And that's what he's going to talk about today. So Grant, what are your three words that you would use to describe why Canada should look to blue hydrogen as part of its net zero and circular economy journey? Three words I like are prosperity, competition, and health. I think Prosperity is obvious uh, to remain a big part of the global export future. <clears throat> we have to switch to lower carbon uh, for comp competition uh, reasons. So that fits in with that as well to re remain competitive as an economy. And also health. If people are using hydrogen in throughout our, our economy, there's a lot of health benefits to that because the air gets a lot cleaner. Great. Lots of super ideas there. Sarah. Hey, thanks. I'll introduce now Greg Caldwell from ATCO. Greg is a professional engineer and CPA, and he's got um, a really interesting background, a combination of engineering, business strategy, finance, and regulatory policy in the energy industry. He's been focused in areas of business strategy, utility regulation, energy policy, and applied innovation, delivering low carbon energy solutions. Greg's uh, got some particularly interesting insight to add today. Um, he's recently been focused on the funding and testing of emerging technologies aimed at combating climate change, promoting energy security, and developing alternative pathways for Canadians to provide for their energy needs. So Greg, what are three words that you would share with the group today that describe why you feel Canada should look to blue hydrogen as it seeks to meet its 2050 targets and embark on a circular economy journey? Sure. So thanks, Sarah. Um, my three words are environment, uh, enabling, and employment. So those are my three words, and they tie in with some of the others, and I'll hand it off back to you guys to introduce the rest of the panel. Many thanks. Super. Next up, we have Brian Jamieson, and Brian is a researcher with ArcelorMittal Global Research and Development. He recently completed his PhD in materials engineering. He works closely with ArcelorMittal DeFasco iron making team, focusing on hydrogen in the future of the iron making processes and how hydrogen may be able to replace carbon as a reductant to produce iron from iron ore and um, how this can contribute to the company's goal of being carbon neutral by 2050. So Brian, what about you? What are your three words? I'll go with a short sentence. Uh, there's few viable alternatives. When you really look at it, there's not a lot of options and that simplifies things greatly. So I'll, you'll see that again in the presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. And I'd like to also introduce Marcel Pouliot, who is a lead consultant with IQ Trucking and a transportation executive. His, he's a professional engineer and an MBA and has had a real variety of experience in the transportation industry, working in everything from operations to industrial services, purchasing, safety, fleet innovation, and sustainability. And he's currently on the board of the Alberta Motor Transport Association and is actively engaged with the Alberta Zero Emission Truck Electrification Collaboration Project. So many thanks to all of you. It's absolutely fabulous to have you here. And Marcel, what would be your three words? Well, my three words are trucking sector decarbonization, because the trucking sector accounts for nine to ten percent of greenhouse gas in Canada today. Many thanks. And as we say, we're very pleased to have you all here. And we're going to shift immediately now into um, a bit of an overview from each of our presenters on various aspects of the hydrogen and blue hydrogen economy as relevant for today's conversation. We'll begin with David. 
Well, thank you very much. Uh, my name is David Lazell. I'm from with the Transition Accelerator and with the University of Calgary. Um, we all know that Canada needs a, a circular economy, but we also need a net zero emission energy system. And what we've been doing in the Transition Accelerator is looking at what is what we need to do in order to get to net zero by 2050. For first thing we need to really understand is we have to move away from the carbon-based energy carriers and the greenhouse gas intense processes that are used to make them. These are carriers that we use today, like gasoline, diesel, jet fuel, and natural gas. And the idea is to shift towards zero emission energy carriers that are produced with little or no greenhouse gas emissions. Things like electricity made from renewable or nuclear sources, or hydrogen uh, that can be made a number of ways without, uh, with very low or no carbon emissions, as shown on this chart. We also need more conservation and energy efficiency, and we're probably going to need some negative emission technologies to, uh, to wrap up and pull out the, the remaining uh, greenhouse gas emissions to the atmosphere. Um, one of the questions is why do we need hydrogen? And hydrogen is what's really different in this mix uh, as we look to a net zero emission energy systems of the future. We need it because some sectors need chemical, not electrical energy carriers. Sectors like freight transportation or, or large fleets of vehicles or many heavy industry sectors just where electricity just doesn't make sense. And indeed, even space heating, uh, especially in cold regions or in large buildings where, where the concept of making electric just uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, there's it's, it's also hydrogen can complement low carbon energy electricity generation. So it really actually, hydrogen isn't a competition to electricity, it's a partner with electricity uh, to take us to a net zero energy future. Hydrogen can also complement biofuel production and it can make a more resilient interconnected energy system than we have today. The concept, you know, so we know Canada has the world's lowest cost um, uh, production of blue and green hydrogen has been uh, studied by a number of countries around the world, but what's the environmental footprint? And the life cycle intensity of, of blue hydrogen is around three kilograms of CO2 per kilogram of hydrogen, and a green hydrogen is somewhere between 0.81 to, to about three kilograms of CO2. So blue and green hydrogen both come in with very low carbon intensities. And indeed, if you look at these carbon intensities and we put them into transportation, relative to our existing systems based on diesel and gasoline, we can reduce carbon emissions by 80 to 95%. Uh, and we can reduce buildings or industry by 67 to 90%. And we can also use hydrogen for long-term electricity storage. So this is the opportunity that, that hydrogen offers uh, to, to Canada today. So how do we get to this hydrogen economy from where we are today? And the issue, the big challenge with hydrogen is it's a gas, it's difficult to move and store, uh, more difficult to move and store than liquids. So the, I think the take home message is we gotta go big or go home. We have to actually start to build out um, significant hydrogen systems in concentrated uh, hydrogen nodes in places where we have the ability to make low cost waste blue or green hydrogen where there's substantial markets nearby where there's ability to connect the two and where we have a scale of supply and demand where the economic works without sustained public investments and of course we need uh, engaged industry governments and academics now i'm going to pass this over to grant strem who's going to tell you about some of his exciting technology Well, welcome. Thank you, David. Uh, I appreciate your presentation as always. Mine is a little bit uh, different focus. It's a technology specific one. In terms of circularity, hydrogen is one of those things that goes into a water molecule and out of a water molecule. And so if there's a surplus of energy somewhere in the world, whether it's process heat or electricity, uh, to find those gaps between uh, demand and oversupply of, of energy, uh, water and hydrogen, water stuff, is actually one of the best um, components and building blocks of a circular economy. Proton Technologies has a way to uh, help accelerate this transition in that direction. And the main way it helps is by dropping the cost. So most hydrogen technologies are trying to compete against diesel, which is a very expensive fuel. And by contrast, we're trying to compete directly against natural gas and believe we can produce hydrogen at lower cost than natural gas. 
How do we do it? It's a combination of old technologies. Uh, we essentially do underground steam reforming, only we use unswept oil as our uh, fuel. And we use an old downhill, downhole, uh, well, a technology from the steam methane reforming industry, a downhole filter that only allows hydrogen through into our production well bores. So our cost structure goes down because the ground is the reaction vessel and we don't have to build a complicated surface uh, reaction vessel and we don't have to buy fuel the whole time. But we do have to build an oxygen plant. So we separate oxygen out of the air, inject it into the reservoir, and a portion of the hydrogen that comes up powers our oxygen plant. So for a typical reservoir, maybe with 200 million barrels in place like our field site, that is going to provide an estimated 50 year uh, project life at 500 tons per day. There's an energy balance calculation, some assumptions that we'll be testing uh, and improving on more and more through time. But essentially, of what comes up, we end up with uh, most of the hydrogen available for sale, and the rest is used on site for powering our process. We started out with a lab demo. Uh, we quickly advanced to a field demo, and we're currently doing a medium scale or maybe a small, another small scale air and steam injection demo that's giving us in the range of five tons a day hydrogen. And right now we're signing up customer contracts and we hope to close on about 2,000 tons a day worth in Canada and start building up probably 500 ton a day building block size or larger. We've got an interesting advisory board and we're hoping to get in and help the world quickly transition because of the economic incentive if it's far cheaper to use hydrogen in turbines than natural gas, for example, we think a lot of people will switch. Over to you, Greg. Uh, thanks, Grant and David, for your presentations. And um, to add to them, I'm gonna jump into the role that, uh, that I believe companies like ATCO and, and other utility and pipeline companies can play to not only enable hydrogen, but to help us achieve our, our emission goals in Canada. So as, as has been widely discussed in, in the two previous presentations, we, we have an emissions challenge and both Canada and Alberta have a, have a part to play in that. And what you can see is um, our Paris commitments are about 219 megatons of, of emissions we're looking to achieve. And, um, and that's really large. It's, it's equivalent to um, the whole Alberta economy is about 277 megatons. And so the question is, how do we get there and why is hydrogen a part of it? What I'd like to share with you is that the magnitude of energy delivery in Alberta uh, what you see in the yellow line is about 250 gigawatt hours a day, and that's the electrical grid here in Alberta. The blue and teal lines are gas deliveries in Alberta. Just the gas distribution system peaks at over 1,000 gigawatt hours a day, and um, the teal line, which is a transmission system, at over 2,000 gigawatt hours a day. To the points made in the earlier presentations, there are industries that need gases for reasons that go far beyond um, just the economics, but also the fact that it's the right way to move energy to them because of the magnitude of energy that they need. And so we believe there's a future not only for pipes, but for pipes full of hydrogen. Um, we've built a project in Australia that uses uh, renewables to, to produce hydrogen, and, and we think that that is a great, uh, that's one possibility, and that's one way to do a low carbon hydrogen. But as was discussed in David's presentation, there's also ways to do low carbon hydrogen from natural gas. And in Alberta, we believe that is what's gonna be the winning solution, at least to start here. And the reason is, is just on cost. We, we, it's much, much cheaper. We um, don't have the renewables penetration in Alberta you see in some other markets, and we don't have the, um, the cost competitiveness of those renewables when compared to our gas resources. We've also built a uh, significant carbon capture infrastructure here in Alberta, and we can use that infrastructure to immediately start to decarbonize the gas mix that we see um, delivered across not only Alberta, but Canada. 
Finally, there's there's a role for export here. And, and, you know, we talk a lot about the economy in Canada, but we don't talk about the circular economy outside of Canada. And I think that um, if we're going to solve this problem, export has to be a part of this. And we need to take advantage of both our geologic and natural resource resources to help other countries decarbonize. And that's how I want to kind of end this is we see hydrogen as an essential component to achieve net zero by 2050. Um, it's not only is it scalable, but it, it can be economic. And um, also we can reuse existing infrastructure in many, many cases to deliver the energy. Finally, uh, cause I'm sure there's people on the webinar from other parts of, of the country, there's a real role for people, for, for not just people, but companies in Quebec and Ontario and Manitoba and British Columbia to play in, in pushing the renewable hydrogen market forward. Um, you know, I said in Alberta, we think that it's carbon capture with natural gas is the way to get going, but that's not necessarily the answer in the rest of the country. So um, this is something that all Canadians can share in. And we believe um, strongly that this will not only create jobs in Alberta, but it will create jobs across Canada and will help the, the building of more intermittent renewables because they'll have a place to put their energy, ultimately, if there's a hydrogen network um, close to them. And when I say put their energy, I'm talking about we, we know renewables get curtailed uh, quite significantly in markets that have a lot of them, and, and we need to resolve that. And part of resolving that is having um, affordable storage for them. So that's my very quick uh, summary of, of why we think hydrogen is important and the role it has to play. And now I'll hand it off to Brian. Thank you, Greg. Uh, so we are, I am representing a heavy industry in high demand of high heat. Um, what does that mean with hydrogen and what does that mean for a circular economy? So steel making and circularity really have a lot in common today. Um, steel achieves three of really four main pillars of circularity. We can use less steel today because the steel design today is actually much more consistent. And as a result, we don't need to worry about overproducing to use the steel. We can use it longer because that steel is tailored exactly for the application we're after. And we can use it again because it's almost 100% recyclable. So where we play a role in a circular economy and need hydrogen is having a method to actually produce steel in a clean way. And that's where hydrogen can help us achieve an economically viable low CO2 production pathway. So high temperature reduction processes, what does that term actually mean? What is high temperature for industry? Well, it's not your home stove. It's not 200 degrees Celsius. It's not even a cement kiln I'm talking about at 900 degrees Celsius. It's not a reheating furnace within the steel industry at 1200 degrees Celsius. The hearth of a blast furnace actually has temperatures exceeding 2000 degrees Celsius. That puts a very huge demand on the fuels that are required to get to this temperature. But the title goes beyond that. It's not a fuel alone, it's a chemical reductant. And that really plays off what Greg said. Today we use carbon, and in fact our ancestors used carbon in a blast furnace. Uh, the combination of iron ore, which is iron bound chemically to oxygen with carbon, produces iron, which makes its way to the steel process, and CO2. From the chemistry alone, there's really no way to get around that fact. So thinking in different ways, how else do you produce iron and eventually steel? Well, the first is electricity. It's the most obvious, but it's also the farthest out. So perhaps a good long-term solution to just simply split apart iron ore with the raw electrical power available, but it's not something we can do in any short amount of time because this is very research heavy. So that pushes us to hydrogen. As the talk of today, it uses pre-existing technology to some extent, which is the DRI process for iron making. It already exists and it's already commercially viable using about 25 weight percent hydrogen in the process gas. So we're looking to go from 25 to 100. Uh, in order to do that, we need a high volume of hydrogen delivered to us. And you can see where blue hydrogen plays a very important role in this. 
It's about half the price of green hydrogen by our estimates. And very obviously in an industry based around commodity product, it's very important to have a good solution for creating an economically viable product. So ArcelorMittal has actually identified hydrogen DRI as one of two key net zero pathways for steel production in the future. And this is why Blue Hydrogen in Canada really plays an important role in the future of the steel industry and in a Canadian circular economy. With that, I will hand off the presentation to Marcel. Thank you, Brian. My name is Marcel Puglio, and today I'm going to talk about the Azatec project, which is a fit for purpose technology validation of fuel cell electric drive systems for heavy highway trucks. The Canadian trucking sector is an essential part of Canada's economy. Canada has a population of 38 million people and to drive across Canada from coast to coast to coast is 8,500 kilometers one way and crosses six time zones. As a result, Canada has developed an efficient multimodal supply chain network which relies heavily on trucks for over the road freight. Last year, the trucking sector delivered 640 million tons of goods within Canada for domestic trade, which is 75% of total domestic volumes. Trucks also transported $430 billion worth of cargo between Canada and the United States, which is 60% of the value of import exports between the two countries. The on-road freight sector is also a large consumer of diesel fuel. Last year, it consumed 25 billion liters of diesel fuel and emitted 61 million tons of CO2, which was 9% of Canadian greenhouse gas emissions. As mentioned, the Azatec project will validate the fuel cell electric drive fit for purpose technology under the unique demands of the province of Alberta. The project includes the design, assembly, and testing of two fuel cell electric highway tractors powered by hydrogen with a 700 kilometer operating range and a legal gross weight of 63,500 kilograms. Note that the two trucks shown on the slides are diesel powered and emit 1.7 kilograms of CO2 per kilometer, whereas the Azatec prototypes will generate zero tailpipe emissions. The project budget is $17 million. The Alberta provincial government through the Emissions Reduction Alberta program is contributing a $7.3 million grant. During the on-road test phase, the prototypes will be powered by hydrogen produced from Alberta natural gas via steam methane reforming. The ACETEC project has three major objectives. The first objective is for the Canadian trucking industry to guide the development of electric drive technology and fuel cell applications in order to replace the current reliance on diesel fuel without impacting the efficiency and cost of the supply chain. The second objective is to have a credible, viable, and compelling solution for the trucking sector to engage on a zero emission pathway. A reduction of 61 million tons of greenhouse gas without having to increase the distribution cost of goods is a very powerful reason to transition away from diesel. And the final objective is to promote and initiate a Canadian hydrogen economy anchored around the trucking sector. In closing, I have a question for you. How will a zero emission trucking sector benefit the circular economy? Thank you. Back to you, Sarah. Thank you. Welcome back. Well, thanks everybody. This is really interesting and we're going to get straight into questions now. Um, to the audience, Stephanie and I have a couple of questions we'll start with while you populate our Q&A. We've got a few questions in there already, but if you haven't had a chance yet, on the bottom right hand side of your screen, uh, you'll see the Q&A function. Right now it says nine on there. There's nine questions. And if you see a question on there that you like, you can um, click your button on the little thumbs up and it will upvote your question and the ones with the most votes go to the top of the list. So we'll start coming to those and please feel free to add your questions in. Um, and as you do that, we're just gonna uh, get started with a couple. So actually, Brian, I'm gonna come to you first with uh, an initial question from a circularity perspective. So blue hydrogen, of course, is positioning itself strongly in the low carbon agenda. 
Um, the circular economy agenda, as you know, also includes zero waste and regeneration of natural systems. As blue hydrogen begins to scale up, do you see that there are or might be key possibilities for also positioning blue hydrogen against these other circular economy criteria of zero waste and regeneration of natural systems? And if so, how could that happen? Can you clarify the question? <laughs> yeah. so is there any way that blue hydrogen could act against zero waste and regeneration of natural systems? That's a, maybe one of the um, yeah, so one of the very interesting topics that I've seen come up is the idea of uh, creating artificial methane, essentially, uh, from CO2. So when you're looking at heavy industry producing CO2, you can look at it as a way of remo you remove the carbon as an input is one method of reducing the overall CO2 emissions. But if for whatever reason that's a difficulty, you could consider using hydrogen on the back end as a method of converting the CO2 into something else, which would be a synthetic methane, and use that elsewhere. Um, there's different path. There's a lot of different pathways to consider. So it absolutely could, if scaled and cost effective. Thank you, David. Any reflections on that? You've been working in this for a long time. Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, I think there's, I can't see really an obvious one. I mean, obviously there's uh, uh, that that it would undermine the circular economy. I think, um, I think it actually could help it because what you're there's a, having a circular economy means moving a lot of goods around. And as as Marcel was uh, alluding to, I think in his presentation, there's uh, that uh, you know if we we have to clean up our ability to move, uh, you know, we, we produce products, we put them out into society, and then we've got to bring them back and, and repurpose them. And uh, I think that, in, you know, I see it as sort of a, a synergy. Um, I mean, I, I actually don't see a big division personally between blue versus green. It's all about the carbon intensity of the processes. And it's about the economics and the carbon intensity. In some areas of Canada, green hydrogen makes a heck of a lot more sense than blue hydrogen. And, uh, and in some areas, it's blue hydrogen makes more sense. And I'd say you look at the resources that you have and you basically use them. Uh, and that's really is, in my mind, essentially the fundamental philosophy of a circular economy is you recognize, recognize things as resources and not, you know, uh, and not waste. And, and I think what we want to do is we want to look at the energy resources we have, whether it's, um, you know, uh, electric, you're really great, low carbon electricity or, you know, or fossil carbon resources with that you can get the energy out and leave the carbon behind. So thank you. Yeah. Maybe following up very much on that question um, or that response, David, um, you know, it's clear that blue hydrogen offers a tremendous transition strategy for mm -hmm. um, uh, the oil and gas regions of the country and, you know, the, mm -hmm. the interest that we're seeing this suddenly really reflects that. And obviously low carbon hydrogen is also very critical to um, the uh, decarbonization agenda. Yet um, some reports I've been reading say the cost of producing green hydrogen is expected to be competitive with blue hydrogen within a decade and cheaper possibly after yeah. that. So is there a risk that we're going to kind of repeat some errors of the past? Is there a risk that a bet on blue hydrogen could quickly become another legacy of stranded assets as the world shifts very aggressively towards the net zero goals for 2050? My sense know. is yeah. uh, we spend a lot of time looking at the scale of the challenge of the, of the challenge and the opportunity. And, and I really hope that, uh, you know, that green hydrogen prices will come down. And, uh, and indeed, uh, with some of the stuff, for example, that Grant's doing and everything is also uh, working on blue hydrogen. I would count what Grant's trying to do as a, another form of blue hydrogen. And I suspect, you know, I think what we're going to see is, is uh, those, there's going to be a lot of competition in that to bring those prices down as well. My issue is um, the competition, hydrogen's really difficult to move around, right? You, you have to move it around in pipelines effectively if you want to do it cost effectively, which means that um, regional production is going to be very important. And I could see, 
into the future that we are going to have, you know, if we have a hydrogen economy, yes, we can move large pipelines of hydrogen around, but there's, I think there's going to be for uh, many years into the future, um, a need for each jurisdiction, each region to identify what's the best way to make hydrogen in that region to, to provide the um, uh, opportunities that the, the, each of the economies need uh, as, an, as an energy resource. It, over time, I think we'll see more and more green hydrogen, absolutely. But I think what's envisaged here is that we use the really cheap blue hydrogen that we can make today at half or one third the cost to build out the infrastructure, yeah. to put the pipelines in place, to put the, get the supply and demand, to get the demand for hydrogen fuel cell vehicles up so that the price of those vehicles come down and we can basically displace the internal combustion engine and displace, um, you know, sort of uh, other, other uh, resources. And once the infrastructure is in place, you know, over the number of decades and, you know, and as the, the storage space for carbon, for carbon storage declines or we start running out of fossil fuels and the prices become higher, um, and the and and green hydrogen starts to compete. It just takes over the same infrastructure. I don't see it as a band. I don't see it as a stranded infrastructure. I see it's part of a transition pathway to get us from where we are today to a, a, a more sustainable tomorrow. Any other panelists want to comment on that question? Have other different insights? Well, I'll I'll just say going back to the slide I showed on you know magnitudes of energy delivery that. Even if green hydrogen can compete on price, we have the, the technical question of how do we generate enough electricity to produce enough green hydrogen? Right. Uh, on top of all the other demands that are coming down the pipe for electricity and... Yeah, our... exactly. I mean, if as long as our economies um, across the globe continue to grow, energy demand will grow. So this is not something that is... Uh, um, likely to reduce over time and you know if we're displacing fossil fuels the amount of fossil fuel energy that's consumed every day i mean going back to my slide it's larger than um, the electricity consumed in alberta just on an energy basis so it's like that across the world uh, in any major economy so I, I think to david's point we need everything we can get our hands on to solve the problem quickly and um, i think we all hope to have a purely like a perfectly sustainable energy system at some point, but in the near future, we have to take advantage of what we have available to us, which is technologies using fossil resources with, that are very low carbon. Thanks. If I just uh, jump, jump yeah, in one, one extra thought, I, I'm a big fan of moving forward with what we have. I agree, if we can do scale up of blue hydrogen, hydrogen quickly um, or green hydrogen, they're both cheaper than diesel and gasoline by, by a long shot already. And so um, moving in that direction aggressively, Canada-wide, I think should be a very important goal. And that includes mixing with natural gas in existing streams. And if in the future, green hydrogen costs get lower than blue, I, I do think that uh, the sunk cost, you know, those, those blue hydrogen facilities will have paid for themselves within the 10 year window you, you pointed out. And then just the incremental cost of keeping them going may or may not be uh, competitive against green, but I, I suspect it will be. We, if you have large legacy systems, you find ways to get creative with them. So uh, I'm, I'm excited about all, all things hydrogen should proceed aggressively. Um. We're going to come now uh, and start with audience questions. We have quite a number, so thanks very much for um, sharing those. And I'm going to start with the one that has received the most votes. And it's the question, and I think we will, um, I'm going to just toss this to the wide open panel here, and whoever wants to dive in can. Whether blue or green hydrogen, what amount of energy is required to produce it versus the energy created? Given that I can, I can offer a comment on that. If you're starting with electricity and making hydrogen, it's about a today our technology today around eighty percent uh, conversion efficiency, a higher heat value. Um, if you're starting with uh, natural gas and making hydrogen, it's about a seventy-four percent conversion efficiency. 
if you actually are talking about making the hydrogen, capturing the CO2 and sequestering the CO2. So in terms of an energy basis. So, so they're, they're sort of in a similar range. Um, the reality is, is that if you're starting with electricity and then, so, you know, making hydrogen, obviously if, if you could have a system where you can use uh, electricity directly and don't go through hydrogen, I'd say do it, absolutely do it. The problem we have is in, as we know, within freight transportation, with, within space heating for houses, there's, there's not always that opportunity in, 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 all, in some cases, and certainly in steel making, it's, there's, uh, there's um, some really promising, uh, more promising with hydrogen, even though you might have an energy loss. So it's, there's a lot, when you're looking at choices on energy systems, it's, there's a lot of things to think about. There's certainly efficiency and, and energy efficiency is important. But there's a whole lot of other um, things to put in the, on the balance to determine what the, you know, what makes sense, how long it takes to refuel, um, the cost. The cost is the most important. Thanks, David. Others? I, I just point to SAG D all the time. Uh, Steam-assisted gravity drainage is an oil process that, on an energy basis, we burn more natural gas to produce the steam than we collect in oil energy. Just oil is a higher value per gigajoule than the natural gas going in. So it doesn't matter what the efficiency is. It actually only comes down to the economics, whether it proceeds or not. And Marcel here, just an interesting stat uh, for the Azatec trucks that we're building with hydrogen cell. Um, we expect that one kilogram of compressed hydrogen at 250 bars is going to give us about the same uh, range as uh, 3.5 liters of diesel. So um, there's a bit of a comparison there. So 100 kilograms would be equivalent of putting 350 liters of uh, diesel in a truck. Thank you. Yeah, I'm going to move on to another question that's come in. Um, and it's really talking about the issue of scale. So David, you gave us the challenge of, you know, go big or go home. Um, I think you were referring to let's go big with our vision on hydrogen and our ambition on hydrogen. Uh, the question here is really, um, is it possible to go small and actually use hydrogen as a source um, to provide energy for at the community scale? So um, is there kind of a, We've talked a little bit about kind of industrial applications for yeah. hydrogen. What about those um, remote communities and small communities? What's the, Actually, uh, I think it's quite an exciting opportunity there, especially in uh, remote communities where uh, you might have sort of a good wind resource and you want to put wind energy to electricity, but then sometimes you have more wind than what you need in electricity. You could make it to hydrogen and then make it back to electricity. I think that there's making these um, economic are, are challenging in Southern Canada because we have a grids and everything else. And I think there's some significant, uh, pretty exciting opportunities that uh, I think we need more work. Uh, we need uh, some, some uh, creative in, in initiatives to actually explore the feasibility, especially in remote communities that have to fly in diesel fuel. There is a opportunity there because the prices that you're paying um, uh, to, to possibly do things uh, it's smaller. So I don't, you know, yeah. And so Greg, is that a conversation in the utility sector in terms <coughs> of, you know, the potential role for hydrogen as a, um, as a, a storage medium as opposed to, um, yeah. you know, as David has outlined, yeah. Yeah, de definitely, I mean, Obviously, there's different end uses here, whether we have remote, very rural communities versus, you know, distribution systems in Calgary or, or Edmonton or Toronto or Montreal, like they're very, very different opportunities. But, um, you know, the question as I read it is, is saying creating small amounts of hydrogen to provide energy for local communities. And what I'll say is even local communities use a lot of energy. And uh, when you look at um, a typical home in Canada, uses about 6,000 kilowatt hours a year of electricity and uses about 30,000 kilowatt hours a year of space heat. That's just average. So when we're talking about providing that heat, you know, there's a reason why we're saying you need pipes to do it. And, um, you know, I think that ultimately we can go really small. Um, you're going to lose some of the economics and, and the scale 
you know, efficiencies of scale you get with going big. Um, so it can be done, but right now I think we're more focused on on going big to, to David's comments because we know we can get the price down and maybe, I don't know if Grant wants to jump in, but like what he's talking about, some of his, like a single well isn't that big, but it can be very, Grant, if you want to jump in. Yeah, I, I think our process is definitely um, economy of scale is a factor. If you're looking at electrolysis uh, off of your solar panels on your roof or your garage, I think that that's something that, um, you know, there will be a bit of a cost premium versus ATCO piping hydrogen to you, for example, but it's all, it's all possible, certainly. I'll add as well, um, when you're talking about remote communities, you may be talking about remote mines as well, which is a big, big feeder for us, obviously. So, um, there's definitely applications there that have value. I'm going to pick up on, uh, on this comment about remote communities and communities in general. And this is going to have to be our last question just because we're coming up on time. It's been very quick and very interesting, but, um, just uh, to the panel, and Marcel, I'll come to you first for this, and others can ring in if they'd like to, but many see the circular economy, of course, as a way to reimagine the ways in which various marginalized or underrepresented groups are engaged in creating our future economy. So what new or unusual opportunities do you see in shifting toward greater production and use of blue hydrogen that could benefit communities traditionally marginalized or underrepresented either in the energy sector or in the emerging circular economy? Well, well first of all, uh, you know, trucking is a big part of that. And um, a lot of smaller communities uh, who rely on trucking also invest in trucking and have their own smaller communities uh, sponsoring trucking companies to support them. Uh, one thing that struck me is, you know, when you look at how trucking performs today, in a lot of ways, it performs according to the circular economy model. We talk about reducing, um, reducing uh, emissions. We talk about intensifying the use of uh, the vehicles. We talk about maximizing the residual value of the assets, uh, servitization where the assets are actually um, um, uh, leased. And all of those elements, when you look at a uh, hydrogen electric truck, uh, will actually change that and make that even easier. And as an example, um, a diesel powered truck today has 22,000 moving parts. An electric drive hydrogen fuel cell trucks has 6,000 moving parts. Therefore, extending the life of the asset and so on and so forth. But the other thing too is today, once you look at supporting those smaller communities and you look at the much, you know, the long distances uh, where they don't have, you know, uh, other, other modes of transport, um, by decreasing or, or having a hydrogen truck with a, a you know, a five or 10% uh, footprint um, and cost actually, or footprint, I mean, relative to a diesel truck, uh, I think some products uh, that are just left there today to rot and uh, not or cannot be brought to um, you know, be commercialized in the larger centers would all of a sudden start making a lot of sense. Um, especially if uh, not only can we maintain but even reduce the total cost of ownership through electrification and long distance electrification, which cannot occur with batteries today. The technology just, just isn't there today right now. Hope that answers. Yep, that's great. Any other quick reflections on the social possibilities from blue hydrogen and scaling up so, blue hydrogen? So if I, I can jump in just on kind of how we look at doing things at ACO. So we, we recently completed a project called Alberta Power Line. Uh, I won't get into it, but it's obviously a power line. And, and we uh, work with an Indigenous organization for them to acquire a 40% ownership in that project, in that asset. And uh, additionally, the, the province of Alberta has now announced a number of programs to kind of incentivize, you know, I'll call it shared benefit or, or, or joint use agreements where, um, to your point, traditionally disadvantaged um, groups or communities are, are given a, a, a place to participate. And I just think that for us, like what I, what I talked about it very quickly in my presentation is we need new infrastructure. And we need to do things in places where we haven't done it before across Canada to do this hydrogen opportunity. And so I'm not going to give the solution, but I just think that we need to work with 
those communities to make sure they benefit from, from whatever this is. So um, for those that are interested, it's called Alberta Power Line. You can Google it about how we went about that, but um, that's kind of what we view as the way to do business moving forward in Canada. Um, on behalf of the Circular Economy Leadership Coalition and the Energy Futures Lab, thank you very much to the panelists and to all the audience members for being such fabulous participants in this dialogue. We look forward to continuing it. Thank you, Stephanie, for being part of this as well. And um, we will see you in the next virtual space in relatively short order. And in the meantime, forward for uh, a future that we all want and need. Thanks very much, everybody. Bye-bye.